Nine, I'm Jim Lehrer. On the news hour tonight, the news of this Monday, then a look at the violent rioting in France. A newsmaker interview with Marine General Peter Pace, the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. An election eve report on the hot, close race for governor of Virginia, and the story of the Mail and the Patriot Act. Major funding for the News Hour with Jim Lehrer has been provided by The Golden Years When Life Was Easy. Wasn't always like this, believe me. I almost lost my shirt when my business hit the wall in 1984. We didn't take a vacation for years. Our financial guy helped us find the way back. But it's been a long road here. We're not taking anything for granted. Barney, this is who we are. This is how we earn it. Somewhere in the heartland, a child is sitting down to breakfast, which is why a farmer is rising for a 15-hour day, and a trucker is beginning a five-day journey, and ADM is turning corn and wheat, soy and cocoa beans into your favorite foods. Somewhere in the heartland, a child is sitting down to breakfast, which is why so many work so long and take their job to heart. ADM, resourceful by nature. And by Pacific Life and CIT. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. French leaders struggled today to halt widespread rioting. They authorized local officials to impose curfews as the violence entered at 12th night. Sunday night was the worst yet. Rioters fired on police and hurled firebombs into churches and schools in more than 300 towns. They also burned 1,400 cars. One man died of wounds after being beaten, the first death in the unrest. There were also reports of violence in Belgium and Germany. The trouble involves immigrant youths from Muslim and North African countries. We'll have more on the story right after this news summary. Search teams in Indiana found the body of another tornado victim today. That makes 22 killed in the twister that struck early Sunday. Gwen Eiffel narrates our report. Rescuers in Indiana continue to sift through heaps of debris in search of tornado survivors and victims today. The deadly twister hit with little notice around 2 a.m. Sunday morning, its winds clocking at least 158 miles per hour. The storm carved a 20-mile swath of destruction across northern Kentucky and southwestern Indiana. The back window blew out, then all the debris and stuff from the back room come in on top of me. And uh, then I was swirling around inside the house on my bed where I just went to bed. All of the dead were in Indiana. Another 200 were injured. It was the state's deadliest tornado in three decades. The Eastbrook Mobile Home Park outside of Evansville, where most of the bodies were found, was devastated. Mother Nature picked the worst place to drop in a tornado in, in this event. It's, a, it's an open farm field. Vandenberg County Sheriff Brad Ellsworth spoke to reporters this morning. 350 mobile homes that, that are more vulnerable in a storm of this magnitude, and there is not a close place to go. I mean, as you see here from the scene, uh, there's not a place to escape to in this short amount of time. Warning sirens sounded about 10 minutes before the tornado hit, but most residents were asleep. The trailer was shaking. You know, we, we just woke up. We didn't know what was going on. Glass shattered. Didn't hear the sirens at all until after the fact. Officials said residents will have to wait at least another day before they are allowed back into the area. In Iraq today, a suicide car bomber killed four American soldiers at a checkpoint south of Baghdad. Nearly a dozen Iraqis were killed in other attacks. To the west, U.S. and Iraqi troops fought house to house in Huseyba near the Syrian border. U.S. officials said it's a stronghold for al-Qaeda. About 2,500 American and 1,000 Iraqi troops launched the assault on Saturday. U.S. officials said one American had been killed, along with nearly 40 insurgents. The plan called for coalition troops to stay in the town once it's taken. But al-Qaeda warned the Iraqi government would pay a very heavy price unless the offensive stops. 
The U.S. military has charged five elite army troops with abusing prisoners in Iraq. A statement today said three detainees were allegedly punched and kicked on September 7th. The accused are all members of the Army Rangers. The U.S. Supreme Court will hear a challenge to U.S. military tribunals at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The court agreed today to consider the case of Salim Ahmad Hamdan. He's a former driver for Osama bin Laden. Arguments are scheduled for next spring. President Bush strongly defended U.S. handling of terror suspects today. He was asked about reports of CIA prisons at secret sites around the world. The president did not confirm or deny those reports, but during a stop in Panama, he said he'll do what it takes to protect the country. We are finding terrorists and bringing them to justice. We are gathering information about where the terrorists may be hiding. We are trying to disrupt their plots and plans. Anything we do to that effort, to that end, in this effort, any activity we conduct is within the law. We do not torture. The Senate has passed a measure banning torture. Vice President Cheney has lobbied lawmakers to grant an exemption for the CIA. The president talked up free trade again today, but he ended his Latin American trip with no agreement. The U.S. was one of 34 nations at a weekend summit in Argentina. They failed to get a deal on restarting talks for a free zone that spans the Americas. Still, Mr. Bush said he was confident the talks will move ahead in the future. A new study today called for customized care for some 10 million cancer survivors. The research was sponsored by the Institute of Medicine, an arm of the National Academy of Sciences. It found survivors can face a range of physical and psychological problems after treatment ends. They may also have trouble keeping insurance coverage and even their jobs. The study recommended a personal plan to guide future care for each patient. The internet file sharing service Grokster agreed to shut down today. Its software was widely used to copy music and movies for free. The company halted operations to settle a landmark suit by the film and music industries. It also agreed to pay $50 million. On Wall Street today, the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 55 points to close at 10,586. The Nasdaq rose more than eight points to close at 2178. British author John Fowles has died. He passed away Saturday at his home in England after a long illness. Fowles' career spanned more than 40 years. He was best known for The French Lieutenant's Woman, published in 1969. His other works included The Collector from 1963 and The Magus from 1965. John Fowles was 79 years old. And that's it for the news summary tonight. Now it's on the violence in France, Joint Chiefs Chairman Pace, the race for governor of Virginia, and using the Patriot Act. The riots in France. We start with a report from the Paris suburbs by Lucy Manning of Independent Television News. There will be no no-go areas, said the French government. But last night, Gounier in northern Paris was one area no one, not even the police, wanted to go to. A crowd of 200 hooded youths lured police into the housing estate and attacked them. Shots were fired from pellet guns. Ten officers were injured, two seriously, one after being shot in the neck. This was the most serious rioting since the violence began. Youths taking on the police in running battles. Uh, it's very, very dangerous, and uh, uh, there are many, many policemen are uh, blessed, injured. Blessed, injured. Do Do you have control? Are the police the police are in control? Uh, the police are, has uh, the, the the control, uh, but uh, it's uh, very, very difficult. The streets were littered with tear gas canisters. Their orders are to regain order on the streets. But in Paris, as in Marseille, Saint-Étienne, Toulouse and Lille, the rioters still have the upper hand. By day, the deprivation on this estate is obvious. The mainly immigrant community have little prospects. The youth stand on the street corner showing each other the mobile phone pictures they took of last night's riots. 
There is no fighting here on the streets now, but there is discussion, there is argument, and they are angry. They are angry that they don't feel French, they are angry at the government and at the police who they say are provoking them. Maybe I have, I have a paper French, but I, I, think, I, I don't think I, I'm a French people, but, uh, because they think we are not French. I, I'm, I'm French, I have the paper French, but when you go to the, to the post, uh, the post, the poli uh, come on, the uh, police station, police station, you're not French. Sarkozy, he has done a lot of work with Yankee. Sarkozy did a really terrible job. He really messed it up. He treats us like we're dirt off a car tire. I'm not a tire. And so Mr. Sarkozy, the interior minister, his name a dirty word in these parts, met community leaders and admitted France had got its integration policies wrong. Et puis faut en même temps reposer la question extrêmement difficile. At the same time, we need to ask hard questions about immigration and integration. We can see that the French integration model is not working and needs to be seriously revisited. Qu'il est aujourd'hui en situation d'échec. In the Arab cafes, the talk is of how to make things right. Stefan Raoui met with the Prime Minister Dominique de Villepin last week, taking the view from the banlieue to the politicians. These people uh, doesn't have, don't have nothing, and uh, now they, they want something, and they want to uh, obtain exactly the same right and same condition uh, as the other French in other parts of the country. But they're trying to achieve it through violence. This one is not uh, not clever from them, but they they, uh, they don't know other way to speak. Tout ce qui est intégration, discrimination, everything that is to do with integration, toutes les and discrimination has been set aside. All the republic's values, liberty, liberty equality, equality, and fraternity don't exist anymore. Despite Muslim leaders announcing a fatwa forbidding Muslims from joining the riots. Nothing has stopped the burning or stopped the burning from spreading. They say they want change. The question tonight is whether the government's new proposals for improving the deprived areas will finally halt these riots. And Ray Suarez. Late today, French Prime Minister Dominique de Villepin gave cities and towns the authority to impose curfews. To discuss the government's response and the origins of the rioting, we turn to Alexis Debat, a contributing editor to The National Interest and a consultant for ABC News. He was a French defense ministry official and social worker before moving to the U.S. And Alec Hargraves, author of Immigration, Race and Ethnicity in Contemporary France. He's a French professor at Florida State University. Alexis Debat, 12 nights of unrest. Uh, what are we to make of this now? Why? Why is this happening? Well, what started as isolated clashes quickly became a political opportunity for these people to put their situation uh, at the forefront of the political debate, to, to make headlines with their own situations. But now, with the foreign media even giving extraordinary coverage of these events, it is becoming almost a historical opportunity, a historical event, a turning point that everybody wants to be a part in, everybody that is in the situation that is. Professor Hargraves, do you agree with that analysis? I do think that what we're seeing now is something on an unprecedented scale. It should be said that the events of the last 10 days haven't come from nowhere. For example, since the beginning of this year, 28,000 automobiles have been torched in French cities, uh, 7,000 or so of them uh, in the last 10 days. These problems are rooted in very deep-seated social, deep social inequalities, problems of discrimination, and it should be said political neglect. And I think it is true that we may be seeing now an opportunity at last for politicians in France to uh, confront and hopefully make progress on some of these very difficult issues. Professor, it was said to have started with the accidental deaths of two teenagers who were being chased by the police, but it's kept on going for a week and a half since then. What is fueling the fire? One of the things which I think has fueled this particular escalation has been the handling of the situation by the interior minister, Dominique de Villepin. 
Uh, he made some very, it has to be said, inflammatory remarks. He talked about uh, youths involved in violence as being uh, scum. The French uh, word that he used was racaille. And that really incensed a lot of these young people and I think uh, helped to galvanize uh, the events uh, which we've seen. And it has to be said that right now, uh, de Villepas, I beg your pardon, Sarkozy, who has made his name as being a tough and effective interior minister, is proving to be anything other than effective because the situation is very far from under control now. And it was, to be clear, it was the interior minister who used the term Rakai. Uh, we saw him in the tape report that preceded our conversation, and he said, uh, Alexis Debye, that we have to ask hard questions about the French integration model. What was he talking about? Oh, indeed. Um, he was talking about the fact that no French government in the past 20, 30 years has been able to create the conditions of economic growth and social integration in these poor uh, immigrant neighborhoods to the point that these second generation immigrants who are torching these, these cars now uh, feel like second class citizens. So it is not just uh, an adjustment that is needed, but a, but a true cultural re revolution uh, to make sure that these people are not excluded from the mainstream French community uh, to, to kind of plug that racial divide between the uh, white French and the immigrant French. But we saw them in the tape report saying that they're told that they're not French, that they don't feel French. And we're talking not about people who came to the country of France as youngsters, but people who are often the grandchildren of immigrants. Why do they feel that way? What is it about French society? I think the critical point was made by the young man who was interviewed in that piece from France, who said, um, I have French papers, but when I go to the police station, they treat me as if I'm not French. It's the fact that they're excluded and treated as not belonging in French society that gives them that feeling. What they want is an opportunity to participate in French society. And if that is denied to them, these particularly young folks that we're seeing at the moment, these are just teenagers. They believe at the moment that when they look at their older brothers and when they look at their, what's happened to their fathers, that there seems to be no way ahead for them in French society. And that's why they're now targeting these, for example, institutional symbols such as the police, and also, of course, automobiles, which are symbols of what they're excluded from. They want to participate, they want to be French, but they're being told that they're not French. Go ahead, Alexis. No, uh, uh, the point that the professor is making is, is excellent. Uh, the, I would like to add that it's mainly an issue of employment. Um, today, a French Muslim has one-eighth to one-tenth the chance of a non-Muslim French, uh, a French national with a non-Muslim name to get a job. I mean, there is a uh, pervasive, uh, very dark racism in French society that associates the second generation Muslims, these the second generation immigrants, uh, with trouble. And we're, we're talking about a, a, a generational change that is going to be needed. Some very tough questions are going, uh, going to have to be addressed. And I'm afraid that the people who are going to address them are the same people who were not able to address them in the past 20 years. And that's what these riots are about. They're about the, 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 the lack of trust in the French government uh, by these people, the lack of trust of in the French elite to, to make to make a difference. There is, today there is no organization or institution to channel this anger, because those political parties have been totally discredited. Well, Professor, you've noted the confrontational style of the French Interior Minister Nicolas Sarkozy. Uh, has this crisis exposed splits inside the French leadership on how to approach the problem, what to do? Well, very interestingly, this particular French government, which took office in June of this year, has the first ever minister of North African immigrant origin, Azouz Bagag. Uh, he's responsible for equal opportunities, which is, if you like, the French way of talking about anti-discrimination policy. And in the early stages of the disturbances, uh, which we've seen during the last 10 days, uh, Mr. Bagag was openly critical of Nicolas Sarkozy. Officially, what he criticized was the language used by the interior minister, not strictly speaking his policies, but it's quite clear that someone like Bagag would favor a much more conciliatory approach than the confrontational approach we've seen from the interior minister, Sarkozy. What about the prime minister, Alexis, and the president? 
Well, what you're seeing is, is also a very interesting political background to all of this, is that you have two people, two men, well, three, actually. You have uh, President Chirac, whose protege is uh, Prime Minister de Villepin on the one side, and on the other side, you have uh, Interior Minister Sarkozy, and it is widely believed that either de Villepin or Chirac, but most probably de Villepin, and Sarkozy will be the contenders in the 2007 presidential elections. And uh, in, in, in the piece that, that uh, preceded this discussion, you saw that Interior Minister Sarkozy was talking about integration. I mean, that's a way for him to uh, move back to the center where the battle is going to be in, in 2007. And the center right now is occupied by Prime Minister de Villepin. There are some very fundamental political issues here. Well, is there a point at which the sympathy in the rest of France, or what sympathy there may be in the rest of France for the plight of people stuck in these poorer suburbs, evaporates, mm -hmm. and a government crackdown uh, becomes more likely? A really hard core crackdown. I think we're reaching that point now. I think you're starting to see demonstra demonstrations, uh, silent demonstrations against the violence. You're starting to see people coming out, uh, community leaders coming out against the violence. A lot of Islamic leaders, by the way, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, you mentioned fatwas, but a lot of um, even Salafi uh, leaders are coming out and saying we have to stop the violence. And one of the most interesting phenomena about these riots is that, for the most part, the neighborhoods where the Salafi influence is and the strongest. And that is Salafism? What Salafism, is yeah, where, where, where radical uh, Islam is the most influent, are the neighborhood that are the quietest right now. Uh, and it has to deal with the fact that in these neighborhoods, this rebellion is being channeled through religion. And as, as, as bad as it is, uh, it is a more constructed, more democratic way, if you will, of expressing uh, uh, anger than just burning cars. Professor, there have been look-alike uh, outbreaks in Brussels and in Britain. Uh, is there a risk of wider European backlash? Well, it's certainly true that some of the problems which we see in France are fairly closely replicated in other European countries, Great Britain, Netherlands, Belgium, Germany. Um, I think uh, if you look at the situation in Britain, we've actually seen very similar events to what uh, is happening in France right now. We saw very similar events in Britain in the 1980s, uh, and indeed there were some uh, quite serious riots in Britain as recently as a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm not sure what the, while the potential exists for uh, similar things in these other countries, I'm not sure that we are likely to see anything on the scale that we've seen in France. And I think that one of the reasons for this is that certainly in countries such as Britain and the Netherlands, there has been a much greater political will over the last 10, 20 years to try to do something about the problems of discrimination. That's something which has been signally absent in France until very recently. Dominique de Villepin tonight on French television did talk about uh, making greater efforts to fight discrimination, but it was all rather vague. The uh, point that he hammered home the most tonight uh, was about restoring order. And the other measures about which he spoke in his TV interview uh, were really uh, far less uh, substantive. Professor Hargraves, Alexis Debas, gentlemen, thank you both. Still to come on the news hour tonight, General Pace, the Virginia governor's race, and a Patriot Act story. And to our newsmaker interview with General Peter Pace, he became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the end of September after serving as vice chairman for four years. He's the first Marine to be chairman who is the principal military advisor to the president and the secretary of defense. General Pace, welcome and congratulations to you, sir. Thank you very much, Jim. Great to be with you tonight. Thank you. Uh, today's major offensive or the ongoing major offensive uh, up near the Syrian border, it's still underway, right? It is. That's right. And what is its mission? Well. Uh, twofold. Number one is to clear out that area of insurgents, uh, part of an ongoing campaign across Iraq to seek these pockets of resistors and uh, deal with them militarily. Also to then establish under Iraqi uh, military control of that area so that um, as we prosecute these kinds of uh, campaigns, um, you have an opportunity for the Iraqi people to see their own armed forces uh, taking over responsibility for their own areas. 
Now that's a new thing, isn't it? To go into these areas that were heavily insurgent and, uh, and stay there? It is a um, growing opportunity for the Iraqi army. Right now there are, um, in the field, Iraqi armed forces, one division headquarters, 15,000 men, four Iraqi brigade headquarters, each of about 3,000 men, 24 Iraqi battalions, each of about five to 600 men that are taking over responsibility for various sectors of the country. So mm -hmm. it is new from the standpoint of the Iraqi army. Uh, it has been what the coalition has done, and now what we are turning over, handing over, are to the Iraqi armed forces. What I meant more was the strategy. You know, the Fallujah thing, uh, Talafar, bo both of those places had to be taken more than once. In the case of Fallujah, the Marines went in there took the place and then left and the insurgents came right back. Same thing happened in Talafar more than once. And at this time is it is the new idea that we're that f forces either US forces or Iraqi forces are going to keep that from happening again if this place does actually fall. What is it uh, who what is, I wrote it uh Husayba? is that if it actually falls to coalition and Iraqi forces, we're not going to pull out this time? It, it will certainly fall the coalition and Iraqi forces, and, and uh, the Iraqi forces will stay. But that's a new thing, right? Um, I understand how you say a new thing. It's not, it was not the intent in the past uh, to w walk away from those kinds of victories. Uh, as it turned out, we thought that once we had uh, turned a town over to the local uh, people, that they would be able to defend uh, uh, their own uh, territory and take care of themselves. As it turns out, the uh, insurgents would come back in. So now the Iraqi armed forces that have been trained up will, will do that for their own people. Is it correct to say that uh, the U.S. ambassador to Iraq, Mr. Khalilzad, who has been pushing for this new approach, uh, has been instrumental in getting this done? Uh, ambassador Khalilzad is, is a very, very strong, capable leader, and he works very closely with the U.S. military and with the Iraqi leadership. So yes, he's, a, he's an integral part of the decision process over there and uh, is very influential in assisting all of us in seeking ways to better uh, uh, use the opportunities that are available to us to take care of the Iraqi people. What do you say to those general, uh, some experts in counterinsurgency who said that the U.S. and the coalition went about this the whole wrong way to begin with? That that should have been part and parcel of the original strategy, you go in and take a place and then if you don't stay there, then the people just come back and you just have to keep not only costing a lot of energy and time, but costing a lot of lives, U.S. lives as well as Iraqi lives. Well, I think what we thought would happen was, as I mentioned, yeah. uh, w once we uh, were successful in an area that the people would uh, take uh, hold of their own city and have their own police and be able to uh, lead their own lives in freedom. Uh, what turns out is that the uh, insurgents uh, have come back into some of those came back into some of those locations and had to be uh, booted back out. But when we went back in the second time in some of those cases, then we stayed either with coalition forces or with the uh, new Iraqi armed forces. Is it correct then to put a little spotlight on Husayba that this may be different? That we should watch this more carefully because this is, if this works, then this will be the way to do it from now on out? I think this is uh, another in a continuing series of, of events like this. Uh, we've cleared out Mosul. We've cleared out um, uh, Fallujah, we've cleared out to other areas and have in fact installed uh, the Iraqi armed forces and the Iraqi police. So it's, in a, it's a continuing series of these type of events and, and we'll continue to do that. The stories I've read today, General, indicate that there has been very little resistance in this, that this town of 30,000 was pretty much uh, um, vacated by the time the, uh, the, call, the U.S. There were 2,500 Marines and 1,000 Iraqi troops involved in that. Is that roughly That's control? about right, yes. That's right. And it's a U.S. operation, though. It's controlled by the U.S., right? It's a coalition operation. The commander of the coalition forces is a U.S. officer, mm -hmm. uh, but it's very much in collaboration with the Iraqi armed forces who are working as part of his force. And it will be uh, left uh, for Iraqi security uh, to maintain uh, the freedom that's uh, gained in that area. So, the, But the coalition forces, the 2,500 Marines, uh, once the place falls, are going to leave, right? They will most likely leave, but the timetable would be uh, dependent on, this, on the situation. Uh, preferably, uh, mm -hmm. the Iraqi forces would be able to stay behind and, and uh, take care of themselves. But the coalition commander on the ground will make that decision as far as how soon the Marines can leave, how many Iraqis need to stay behind. Now, the, the, uh, how, would you, how, should, how should it be measured in terms of success? I, I read today, if you could confirm this, that 36 to 40 insurgents have been killed. Is that correct? 
Um, I, I know the answer to that question, but if you don't mind, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you because I truly believe that we do not want the American public or anybody else watching this broadcast to start counting bodies. This is not the way we count success. We count success and we measure success by the security that we provide in these towns for the Iraqi people. This is not about uh, killing uh, people. It is about providing security for people. And if we inadvertently, mistakenly, start counting how many of the enemy are killed, we will be sending the wrong messages to our own troops and to the Iraqi people. We want to provide security for them. Well, now, General, isn't that a change? Isn't, isn't then what you, just con what you just expressed a change? Because up to this point in time, every time there's been one of these sweeps, every time there's been one of these, the, the U.S. military in Iraq is quick to say how many insurgents have been captured, how many insurgents have been killed, and the whole point of the exercise is to destroy the insurgency. You're saying no more. No, I'm saying that anyone who in the past has been counting bodies has, has been presenting the wrong measure of success, that the correct measure of success is how much of this country, how much of Iraq, is being controlled by coalition forces to include, and most importantly to include, the Iraqi armed forces themselves, how much security is being provided. And it's not about death counts, it's about providing security so the Iraqi people can live in freedom. So how do we measure success of this operation? We measure the success of this operation by how quickly we're able to establish Iraqi government control of the area, and then we measure success by watching, as time goes on, the ability of the Iraqi armed forces and the Iraqi police to continue to provide that security. Is it fair to say, as we speak tonight, General, that the insurgency is still very strong and getting stronger? No, it's not fair to say that. I would think that it, what is fair to say is that the, there are still insurgents in the country who do not see that they have an alternative, who have not had the opportunity to have an alternative uh, to, to their lifestyle. And that's why it's so important that the Iraqi government have the chance to have their police, their armed forces for finding security, so that the Iraqi government can then provide schools, um, roads, uh, power, jobs, all the things that allow an individual who's young, and looking for a job or looking for a opportunity to, to support his family to be able to pick mm -hmm. the peaceful way, to be able to pick a job instead of having to pick either nothing to do at all or taking money from the insurgents who will at least pay him some money potentially to feed his family. Are these insurgents that are in this, involved in this uh, operation that's going on now, are they foreigners or are they, you're, you're suggesting they're locals, right? They're local Iraqis who are part of, are, who are, who are part of the insurgency? Jim, probably too soon to tell right now. Certainly too, too soon for me to tell because okay. I, I have not yet seen the reports as far as what they what they found. Uh, we'll know within a couple of days primarily whether it's uh, foreigners or, or, or local. So when you when you say the insurgency is not is not stronger, what do you, what do you what do you mean? I mean that that, that it. There, I looked at all of the uh, excuse me the body counts which you you, you object to, but uh, they it's averaging, for instance, in American terms, seven on average, seventeen Americans are dying every week and have been for months now. There's been no reduction of that. The number of Iraqis is continuing to to uh, remain about the same level. Uh, Iraqi soldiers, Iraqi policemen are being killed on a daily basis or several more today as there is almost every day. So what measurement then do you use to say the insurgency is not getting stronger or not remaining strong? I would say to you that um, first of all the numbers of attacks that have taken place during the October elections and as we get ready for the December elections are indicative of the fact that the insurgency understands that every time an Iraqi goes to the poll and votes, that is a strike against the insurgency. The insurgents fear the fact that Iraqis will be, will be able to pick their own future. So when I say that uh, no to your question about are they getting stronger, mm -hmm. I believe they are not because of the elections, because the 64 percent of the Iraqi populace went and voted because 210,000 Iraqis now serve in their armed forces and their police. Everything that's, that is good and measurable about the stability of the country now and its potential for future stability is working in the new government's favor. That then works against the insurgents and therefore inside that environment I do not see the insurgency growing.
So it's a matter of time, and you think they will eventually start diminishing in ways that we can see here as well. I absolutely believe that, yes. There was a, the uh, military, U.S. military announced today that five Army Rangers are charged with abusing some captured Iraqis. What, what did they do? What's the allegation? Um, I, I do not know the specifics of the allegation. I do know that they were charged. Uh, that is under investigation right now. It would be inappropriate for me to uh, voice an opinion, especially as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs sure. of Staff. I can tell you categorically uh, that uh, any maltreatment of any detainees by U.S. forces or coalition forces is totally unacceptable. That our orders have and will continue to be that we will treat everyone in our charge uh, with uh, hum humanely and with respect. You know, Senator McCain has been, uh, his, his, the Senate has passed, is yet to be uh, approved by the House, uh, uh, legislation that would use the Army, train, the Army manual for, as the, the uh, rules for how to treat prisoners, uh, detainees. And he said that it was necessary because we have changed the rules so often that the average uh, U.S. troop over there doesn't know what he is, he or she is allowed to do at any given time. And he said this, he said that uh, what we do, let me find his quote here, I have it here somewhere. Right here he said, we, uh, he said U.S. personnel don't know what's permitted or forbidden and he said, uh, and when something goes wrong, we blame them and we punish them and we have to do better than that. Do you agree, do you support what he's doing? you support the legislation to make the Army manual the rules and so everybody knows you don't beat up on people, you don't torture them, et cetera? I would say that uh, the members of U.S. Armed Forces understand clearly what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do with regard to the treatment of prisoners and, and detainees and they understand that they are to treat them uh, humanely. Uh, having said that, it is perfectly fine to have the Army field manual for the uh, uh, detention of individuals as the Bible, so to speak, of how we're supposed to be doing business. That's, a, that's exactly what it is. And uh, for the senator to say that we should be following our own rules uh, certainly makes sense. We, we, again, I'm not, I, I would not try to get you to comment on this case of the five rangers, but just generally speaking, for a U.S. soldier, Marine, sailor, whatever, to, to claim that he or she didn't know the rules uh, about how to treat a, a captured Iraqi you just wouldn't buy as a general premise, right? I would not buy that as a person in uniform, and I would not buy that as an American citizen. You're the first Marine to be Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Pace. Um, all Marines, former Marines, think this is a really big deal. It's a significant thing. In a general, more general framework, what does it mean? What, should, what does it mean, uh, generally speaking, to uh, the military to have a Marine for the first time as chairman of the Joint Chiefs? Well, first, if I not to correct you, but you said commandant of the Marine Corps. Oh, I'm and sorry, I, and chairman. I know, I know oh. you meant chairman. We have a great commandant. His name is Mike Hagee, and uh, the and the commandant is always a Marine. <laughs> he's yes, a, he's I'm always sorry. a Marine. Absolutely, Excuse chairman me. of the Joint Chiefs. My apologies. Yes. Um, if, first of all, it's a it's a great honor for me to, uh, to have the president and Secretary Rumsfeld's confidence. Second, uh, this has been an evolutionary thing. As you know, uh, not that long ago, the Commandant of the Marine Corps was not a full member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And then during General Wilson's time as Commandant, the Commandant became a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And then for a while, uh, Marines were not able to serve in the four-star combatant commands around the world that, that have the, all of our troops. And then during Goldwater and Nichols legislation, Marines became eligible to be assigned as four-star commanders. So over the last ensuing 15, 20 years, we've had a number of Marine four-star generals who have commanded our joint commands uh, around the globe. And uh, it has been their performance of duty. It has been all that they have done to show that Marines are capable of commanding at the four-star level, are capable of being joint, are capable of doing the things that the nation would expect of any senior leader. Uh, that has enabled me to be in a position to uh, compete and uh, to be selected. But if, if I'm chairman now, it's because I'm standing on the shoulders of some giants of the Marine Corps who worked hard uh, to serve this country the best they could. General Pace, again, uh, thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much, Jim.
Now an election story. There are many state, local, and initiative contests tomorrow around the country. One that has drawn much attention is Virginia's closely contested race for governor. Kwame Holman has our report. Thank you so much for being here. Virginia's former Attorney General Jerry Kilgore is running for governor and hoping to buck a trend. In Virginia's last seven gubernatorial elections dating back to 1977, the candidate of the party in the White House has lost, and Jerry Kilgore is a Republican. I think every election year is, is, is different, and there would be time for the party to rebound. Guys, thanks for being here. Lieutenant Governor Tim Kaine is the Democratic candidate, and even in predominantly Republican Virginia, Kaine finds himself in a dead heat with Kilgore. The Republican nominee always starts as the Goliath in the race, as the overdog, as the favorite, always. The Republicans' strength in Virginia is obvious. They own both U.S. Senate seats and eight of the 11 seats in the House of Representatives. Republicans have won every presidential race here since 1968. But the race for governor traditionally has been up for grabs. In fact, most political watchers believe the popular current governor, Mark Warner, a Democrat, would win again if Virginia law permitted a second term. Instead, he's providing a critical boost for the Kane campaign. Every step of the way, on every battle that we fought, Tim Kane has been there side by side, helping move Virginia forward. But Jerry Kilgore always is quick to remind that Mark Warner no longer is part of the equation. Governor Warner's not on the ballot. I think that's going to be the surprise of, of many Virginians when they go into the voting booth. The race is between Tim Kaine and me, and Tim Kaine, quite frankly, is the most liberal candidate they've ever nominated to run for governor. However, also working for Kaine and against Kilgore are President Bush's approval ratings. They're at all-time lows, and political watchers nationwide believe the results of this race could be an early barometer of the congressional midterm elections next year. Mark Roselle is a public policy professor at George Mason University and has been following Virginia politics for nearly 20 years. I do think it's telling that in this very reliably red state in which George Bush has won twice, that the campaign is so closely competitive right now, and that may be a signal that the Bush presidency is in a weakened position, that the recent scandals and bad news have hurt Republicans across the board, not just in the White House, and that this is going to have some effect perhaps on the 06 elections. Um, if a Democrat were to win in Virginia, which is a heavily Republican state, I think that would say a lot. But from his vantage point at the Republican National Committee headquarters in Washington, Mike Duhame doesn't see it the same way. I caution people into reading too much into what does that mean on the national level. Congressional elections, Senate elections, governor's elections, I think these will, these will run more about locally what the candidates are, what's important to those states and what's important uh, in those congressional districts and those governor's races. Still, Jerry Kilgore raised some eyebrows when he turned down an opportunity to appear with the president at an event in Norfolk two weeks ago. And their appearance together at a rally in Richmond tonight was a late campaign decision. That tells me that perhaps the Republican Party folks in Virginia see that the Bush presidency is not an asset to their campaign. And Democratic Party officials hope the president's problems will spur a heavy anti-Republican turnout on Election Day. The Democratic National Committee has invested money and more to make that happen. Rodney Shelton is the DNC's deputy political director. We're definitely excited about it. Uh, we put resources in there. We're also allowing uh, staff to go out and to be deployed to, to the campaign. While Tim Kaine is hoping to capitalize on President Bush's troubles, he also has surprised some by embracing a theme popular with Republican candidates. We are a faith and values party. We are a faith and values party. A devout Roman Catholic, Kaine is hoping to avoid the fate many Democrats suffered in the 2004 elections after failing to reach the so-called values voters. Let me say, no party's got a monopoly on faith or virtue or vice. But as I deal with Democrats all over the Commonwealth, Democrats who the other side likes to say are faithless, valueless, Hollywood secularists, Democrats understand this basic principle, that we gotta measure ourselves by what we can do with each other, for each other, to advance the community as a whole. George Mason's Mark Rosell. I think it's an interesting test case of whether a Democrat can be so overtly expressive about his 
religiosity and the importance of his faith to his politics and do as well as many Republicans have in trying to play the faith factor in campaigns. Um, is this going to protect Tim Kaine somewhat from critics who say the Democratic Party doesn't do enough to talk about the values agenda and the things that a lot of deeply faithful citizens really care about? Well, he, he's put that out there up front in this campaign. Kaine's faith became an issue when the question of capital punishment came up. He cited his religion as his reason for opposing the death penalty, and Jerry Kilgore jumped right on it. Over 75% of Virginians support the death penalty as a deterrent to crime. Tim Kaine and I disagree. Kilgore showcased the issue with intensely emotional ads in which the relatives of murder victims condemned Kaine, a former private attorney, for representing the accused. Tim Kaine voluntarily represented the person who murdered my son. He stood with murders in trying to get him off death row. No matter how heinous the crime, he doesn't believe that death is a punishment. Kane, noting that he spent only 40 minutes on that particular case, repeatedly has vowed to enforce the death penalty if elected, and responded with this ad. Jerry Kilgore's attacks are a vile attempt to manipulate for political gain. I think it's really an outrage that, um, that he would take advantage of this man's grief in this way to essentially make the point that you can't trust Cain because he's got a religious belief about the death penalty. Several of Virginia's larger newspapers criticized Kilgore as well, and the candidate subsequently pulled the ads off the air. Still, he defended his campaign. You know, in this race where you have the most two philosophically different candidates running for governor, you're going to have some hard hits, but truthful ones. Jerry Kilgore also criticized Tim Kaine on the volatile issue of illegal immigration, blasting the Democrat for supporting a taxpayer-financed day laborer center. What part of illegal does Tim Kaine not understand? I oppose. I oppose using taxpayer dollars to, to build this site. It says to those illegally in this country that we're going to provide benefits. Kane said he, too, opposed illegal immigration, but argued during a debate with Kilgore that the decision to build the day laborer site should be a local one. Local officials are elected by their own citizens, and they should do what they think is best. So I did oppose the Attorney General, Jerry Kilgore, stepping out and beating up on the local officials for trying to solve a local problem. As Tim Kaine and Jerry Kilgore made their final pitches today to a shrinking pool of uncommitted voters, political analysts prepared to dissect the results, looking for any clues they might reveal about the 2006 congressional campaigns. And finally, not, finally tonight to Margaret Warner for a story about using the Patriot Act. Unbeknownst to most Americans, under the Patriot Act, the government has been issuing tens of thousands of so-called national security letters to businesses and institutions, demanding electronic records, financial and otherwise, about ordinary Americans who deal with those institutions. The Washington Post broke the story yesterday. Barton Gelman of The Post wrote the story and joins us now from Stanford University, where he's on a journalism fellowship. Bart, welcome. Explain more fully what a national security letter is, why don't you use an, a real-life example for us? All right, well, sometime this summer, two FBI agents showed up in Windsor, Connecticut, and they found a guy named George Christian. They handed him a letter. It said two things. It said, give us all the records you have on whoever was using a particular computer in your system, and it said, do not disclose to any person ever that you received this letter. And the system was in a local library, right? This was a company that sort of, what, provides security for computers in libraries? It provides data services for about three dozen Connecticut public libraries, uh, circulation records, internet access, email, and so on. So what kind of information, if this company, if this Mr. Christian had complied, what kind of information would the government have gotten about people who use that particular computer? Well, it depends how the order was interpreted. At minimum, the government would have received, uh, for each of those people who used the computer, uh, where they browsed on the web, uh, what searches they'd sent to Google, uh, what email accounts they opened, and uh, probably uh, to whom they sent email or received email from. 
Now, what other kinds of institutions have, are getting letters like these, and how many are there? Well, in the last year for which a count uh, was uh, collected, and I should mention this count is uh, classified, it's not released publicly, there were about 30,000 of these letters issued. That is not a complete count. There is a category of uh, national security letters that's not included, so there were more than that. And each letter is capable of getting the records of uh, tens or hundreds of people. So the number of people whose records have been gathered uh, is certainly in the hundreds of thousands. It goes to phone companies, it goes to banks, casinos, pawn shops, any broadly defined financial institution or uh, telecommunications provider. And now, who has the authority to issue such letters and what standards do they have to use? The FBI does this on its own. Uh, since the Patriot Act, any field uh, office uh, special agent in charge, uh, so there are about uh, 60 or, or more FBI uh, agents who are able to authorize these things. They don't need any review by a court. The standard is that the FBI judges the information to be quote unquote relevant to or sought for an investigation of terrorism or counter espionage. All right, give us a little more sense of how wide the scope of information is. Let's say you were in email touch with a foreigner on, in your role as journalist uh, that came under suspicion and the government sent a letter of inquiry to whatever internet provider that foreigner used. What would the government get about you? Well, first of all, if you're saying the government uh, has demanded records pertaining to the foreigner, the government would know uh, when I wrote email to this target, uh, when, the, uh, when the target wrote email to me. The government would also learn my identity, and so the government might very well use a technique called contact chaining to find out who I've been sending email to uh, because the government's interested in establishing networks uh, of co-conspirators. And then how, under what circumstances would the government be able to get financial information about somebody who was in a secondary position? The standard remains the same. It's relevance. And I should emphasize what happened in the Patriot Act. Before the Patriot Act, these letters existed. But the FBI had to say that it had specific and articulable reasons to suspect that the person whose records they wanted was a terrorist or was a spy. What the Patriot Act did was say, you don't have to suspect the person of any wrongdoing. You only have to assert that the information that you want is quote unquote relevant to or you're seeking it for a terrorism investigation. So once they've decided that I'm relevant to an investigation, they can get my banking records, my uh, investment records, my gambling records, uh, if I had any gambling records, uh, as well as my phone and email accounts. And why does the FBI say it needs this? The FBI was criticized for failing to connect the dots before 9-11 and failing to detect the plot in advance. It is now casting a pretty wide net. It does not want to, it does not want to be accused of and it does not in fact want to overlook leads that might lead it to disrupt a plot in advance. Now, terrorist networks operate in cells. They conceal their activities. Uh, if one terrorist wants to talk to another, uh, he often uses a cutout or more than one cutout. And so they're trying to find networks of co-conspirators of, and these people, uh, their identities are unknown to the FBI. They want to find them out. What they say is they're using national security letters to cast this net and to find out, do the people we've just swept up warrant further scrutiny mm -hmm. or don't they? And finally, briefly, what happens to all this information? Let's say we'll take the example of you emailing with someone. It turns out there was absolutely nothing suspicious or wrong about that person. What happens to that information on you? It's a good question because until two years ago, what would happen is the FBI would be legally obliged to destroy the information once establishing mm -hmm. that it pertained to an innocent person and was no longer relevant to their investigation. Uh, then Attorney General John Ashcroft in October of 2003 reversed that. He ordered that the FBI keep all records it gathers in all investigations and he ordered that it be shared with other government agencies. And so what they're doing now is they're working on proposals or on, on uh, directions 
to do quote unquote data mining in this where they sift through all the records for unseen patterns. All right, Bart Gelman, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, the major developments of this day, French leaders call for curfews as rioting by Muslim youth spread to some 300 towns. The death toll in the Indiana tornado rose to 22. In Iraq, a suicide car bomber killed four American soldiers, and U.S. and Iraqi forces assaulted a town near the Syrian border for a third day. On the news hour, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Marine General Pace, said the goal of that offensive is to establish Iraqi control in the border region. We'll see you online and again here tomorrow evening. I'm Jim Lara. Thank you and good night. Major funding for the News Hour with Jim Lara has been provided by. Each person has a unique way of seeing the world. That's why, for over 135 years, Pacific Life has offered the power of choice. Pacific Life provides a full palette of financial and estate planning solutions to help you achieve your vision of your future. Pacific Life, the power to help you succeed. Sometimes success needs to be nurtured. Sometimes it wants to be pushed. Sometimes success takes everything we can give and then demands more. And sometimes all it takes is someone who sees what you see. At CIT, we're in the business of financing great ideas so you can take yours all the way to the top. And by Smith Barney and the Archer Daniels Midland Company. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. To purchase video cassettes of the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, call 1-866-678-NEWS. We are PBS.